So now that we have thought about inherent risk, control risk, we have our audit objectives set up. Uh, we've assessed our risk of material misstatement. Now we're moving on to detection risk and designing the audit procedures, right? So this is basically given the audit risk, inherent risk, control risk, how do I need to set up my and manage my set of audit procedures, okay? So this is kind of, you know, where the rubber meets the road, uh, to use an expression. Uh, this is really what the audit is about, right? And so if we start first uh, with test controls, right? Um, the other piece is substantive testing. Let's think first about test controls. And so um, obviously it varies based on the internal control system that is set up by our client, um, the nature of the IT system, uh, you know, how much information technology is being used, how much data can we collect around the controls. Um, and so, you know, it really kind of depends. There are some uh, different categories and different types of tests we can do. Um, you know, we can look at the reconciliations that were done. Uh, there's a little yellow for you. I guess we can keep that. Um, look at, when it's talking about the accounting records here, it's talking about looking for the documentation of the internal controls. So, for example, um, if an account's payable, is it shouldn't be set up until a three-way match is performed. Do we see uh, documentation of that, right? Uh, if there's supposed to be a bank rec, um, do we see the bank rec being performed, for example? Um, specifically for cash, you can look at the cash receipt listing, which is basically just a list of all the the payments we've received from the customers, or the or cut the customers excuse me, where the client has received payments from its customers. So we can compare that against the cash receipts journal, make sure that those are all accounted for. Uh, also can verify that listing against the postings to the subsidiary ledger of account the accounts receivable. So for example, if some of their customers are paying off their accounts receivable, then we should see, um, if we see payments from, excuse me, cash receipts from them on the listing, then we should see a reconciling posting to the subsidiary ledger, right? And then we can also look to see to make sure that what was on that cash receipts listing, um, sh we have an actual deposit slip that's been authenticated or validated um, from the bank. Okay, so that's an example of a test control, or really a series of control tests. Um, we can also look at our recorded disbursements in that cash payments journal and then trace it back to the subsidiary ledger, make sure things were actually, or trace it forward actually to the subsidiary ledger for accounts payable. So if, you know, we pay the supplier, if the, our client paid the supplier, then let's go look at that supplier's AP subsidiary ledger account and see that payment, right? That should be posted. Uh, then we can also go backwards and connect that disbursement to the purchase order, receive and report an invoice, um, and the actual checks, right? When we can see those checks from the uh, from the bank. Um, this next piece kind of depends. Uh, if there are weaknesses discovered, data analysts can be used to test transactions. I would say it depends on where the weaknesses are. Um, if there are weaknesses, if there are IT weaknesses, then all of a sudden now we're not as comfortable with the data that's being generated. But I think what this is basically saying is can we see, um, are there ways in which we can use analytics uh, to find uh, potential problems, right? Um, and then again, since this is after we've actually performed these audit procedures, the results could um, revise the risk of material misstatements. Remember we had that problem where we have a, an assessed um, control risk, right? We had, uh, earlier we had the planned assessed control risk, and now this is kind of the finalized assessed control risk based on the results, right? If the results suggest, yeah, things are operating as strongly as we thought, then we're fine, but let's say, no, we think actually some of those controls are ineffective, right? We find too many problems 
for example, where, um, for example, uh, the bank recs. We find too many issues with how the bank rec was done that we don't feel comfortable, right? saying that that's operating strongly so that could increase our control risk because we think there's less chance that 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 bank rec could help catch a material misstatement so now looking at the other kind of procedure we're going to do which is substantive testing right um, when I'm calling this 10-6c um, so what do the substantive tests look like for cash? Well, so we can look at cash balances um, in terms of how they're changing, reconcile those to the general ledger. Um, confirmations is a big one. So that's when we're actually going to go and communicate directly with the banks as the auditor and uh, have them confirm uh, all the different accounts that our client has with them that's actually a really important um, procedure probably one of the best procedures at least for uh, for example existence uh, of cash um, we'll look and see at the bank recs that were that were done um, and uh, possibly prepare our own version right to make sure that those bank accounts were properly recorded. Uh, sometimes you'll do a cutoff statement. Uh, so that might be something where you're looking at like a, a portion. And so you might have specific, for example, um, the cutoff assertion would say all cash receipts um, were recorded in the proper period. And so do we actually see a bank statement showing some of those deposits that the client booked as of the balance sheet date, right? So let's say they they say, oh, we got this deposit on 1231. So they're counting it towards cash. But if we look at the bank statement and we see that the, that the, um, uh, the deposit wasn't made until uh, after year end, then we might have an adjustment, right? That could hit the cutoff assertion. Uh, and there's other different things. Um, if there is any petty cash, then counting it. Uh, would be something you, you could do as an audit step. Um, uh, analyzing bank transfers is uh, around that year end um, would be something that you'd want to look for to see, for example, there's different uh, frauds that can be done. Uh, one would be if you're trying to inflate cash, you basically transfer from one cash account um, to another but you don't record so basically what you do is you record the deposit in the second account um, before the end of the financial statement period but you don't record the withdrawal of the initial cash account until the next period right and so if you did that it would look like oh we just had you know we have more cash on hand well, it's because you didn't count or the client didn't count that withdrawal from the one account. Um, it only counted the deposit into the second account. So you'd look at bank transfers to see if the client's trying to do um, uh, something like that uh, to inflate cash. All right. And these um, tables where you're looking at a substantive procedure and then matching it up with an art objective slash assertion. These are really helpful to understand how we get this uh, really important link between the procedures and the audit objective. Because at the end of the day, we're trying to verify these audit objectives uh, and get assurance and comfort around those. And if we can't, or if, for example, we think the procedure is getting us assurance, but it's really not, then that's all of a sudden opening us up as auditors to more risk. So any anytime you see any of these tables or their figures that kind of summarize the procedure and the objective, definitely spend some time making sure you understand how uh, those those tie in. So just as an example, um, you know I mentioned that confirmation, Oop. right? The best one that's going to get to is existence of the balance. Um, 
usually it's not going to get to as much around occurrence, but it's really going to tie into existence, um, this confirmation. Okay. Um, the cutoff statement is going to get to that cutoff assertion. Uh, counting cash on hand also gets to existence, right? Um, reconciliations of balances and activity can also uh, get to accuracy, right? That those transactions are recorded accurately, okay? Um, again, kind of the... Um, if you look at this one, we're looking at payments to related parties. Well, there has to be disclosure around a related party transaction, if you recall from your financial classes. And so we look for payments, look for payments to individuals that are connected to the firm, um, and then make sure that those are disclosed uh, properly. Okay, so those are just some examples of how the procedures have, end up tying into the audit objectives, um, but it really is um, important that you understand how these link and re really how any procedure links to the audit objectives. So if you look at the confirmations, a little more detail there. Again, we're confirming these amounts on deposit um, by communicating directly to the banks or the financial institutions. Uh, and there's a fairly standard form um, that the ICPA, the bankers, uh, have basically agreed to. Um, and so uh, what's happening more and more, almost exclusively, but more and more is that these are, there's an electronic confirmation process. So uh, confirmations.com is a, a service that tries to help facilitate this process electronically where you can submit a request to confirmations.com for the, the vendor using the appropriate, you know, address and, um, vendor name and all these things to find the right vendor and then submitting a, a confirmation to them and then there's a standard uh, response that they would um, fill out and complete in order to provide the information and the information goes directly back to the auditor it does not go to the to the client and so here's an example of what the paper document will look like and again the we're doing things more and more electronically but the all of this information would still be available on an electronic confirmation so don't get too caught up in the fact that this is paper and and uh, this is um, old even um, so if we look here You know, we have things like which the actual financial institution this is going to go to. Um, this is the client. Uh, so for the auditor, this is our client, Fairview Corporation. Um, we're worried about uh, 1231. That's the financial statement date. And so um, this would be sent to the bank. And then they would confirm the accounts and the balances so it's possible what you might do is um, kind of have this piece filled out already to say hey we have that there's a general account a payroll account um, what's the balance or you could leave it completely open and have the bank fill this in right so this is the bank looks up Fairview Corporation and then says, okay, these are the accounts that we have on file and the balances. Um, and then these are the uh, additional, in this case, it's a credit line. Um, and so uh, some more information related to, to that as well. So it's not just the deposit accounts, but it can also be the um, credit or liability accounts as well. Okay, and so um, this information then is, again, returned directly to the accountants, right? This is where uh, we're, the auditors are going to get the, so the public, to the public accountants. The auditors are going to get this information, and they, we, don't, we don't want it to go back to the client because we don't want them to try and modify anything and say, oh, yeah, things, 
you know, we don't want them to have access to this to where they can actually change the numbers to match what their records show. We want to be able to get this directly from the bank. So chances are you have um, seen a bank rec before, whether it's an intro to financial or one of the intermediate classes. Um, and so obviously we're thinking about checks that might be outstanding, deposits that might be in transit, uh, other items that are recorded by the bank that haven't been recorded by the client yet. And so we're looking for basically sources of discrepancy among uh, the bank records versus the client records. Uh, proof of cash is a um, uh, audit. Uh, process or an audit activity, audit procedure that is similar in terms of it reconciles the account balance um, for a given period. And so um, it is used to identify uh, what's been recorded um, by the client um, but not on the bank statement. Um, things that have been recorded on the bank statement but not on the accounting records by the client, right? So, kind of have, uh, we're looking for, again, the differences. And the other possibility is that the amounts are different um, between the bank and the accounting records of the client. So we're basically looking for these discrepancies, right, as possible reasons why we might have different balances. Uh, here's an example of what a, that working paper would look like. Of, uh, proof of cash and again yeah I mean nowadays the working papers are going to be electronic um, but you can easily have an electronic working paper that looks like this right in terms of its form uh, the kind of things that it um, is recording right A6 would be A is usually like for cash and so this would be like the sixth working paper in uh, the cash account uh, this would be the individual that uh, performed or this proof of cash and the date that they performed it. Um, uh, this would be proof of cash for September. Oh, that's bad. It's real thick there. Um, that's for September. Uh, and so that's why the the date that it, this was created, this working paper was created for 11-15. The December 31 is just saying for, fisc the, for the fiscal year that ends on December 31, but the proof of cash is just for the month of September, right? Notice we've got this balance at the end of August, the balance at the end of September. And so it's just a different way to kind of arrange a lot of things that we would see in the bank rec items in the bank statement, um, looking at the deposits and transit, looking at outstanding checks, looking at the service charges. Um, and so uh, it's just a different way to kind of arrange. Um, but it you would do it this way because you can kind of see, right, this is kind of the beginning balance information and we can trace this back to different um, uh, different items, right? So we can look at the, we, so the evidence that would be kind of supporting this working paper would be the bank statement from August 31st, the bank statement from September 30th. Um, uh, <laughs> this is showing how old this is per adding machine tape at A42. This would just, this is basically, there'd be a um, a list, essentially, in this case, it's a list of these two outstanding checks, and you would show that amount that's added, and this is just a cross-referencing back to that working paper. Um, same thing for this one over here, it's the same idea. Um, that's old terminology, but we would still have references back to supporting uh, papers now. And then this last one is basically saying that um, this amount was traced to the general ledger, right? This 38,600. So August 31st, if you look at the general ledger for cash, you should see, at least for the um, this account 101, you should see that balance on the general ledger, right? And it, it looks like it does. Same thing for the ending balance, right? The September 30th ending balance, you see that amount reconciled. And notice here, too, um, you're going to see... Uh, some of the activity will be posted to the general ledger and a lot of times it's done in a summary way so you would in this case monthly they're showing their deposits you can see those being 
showing up as activity on the general ledger. Same thing for the checks and charges. So you wouldn't see every single check on a general ledger, right? You wouldn't see every single deposit made on a general ledger. Usually those things are summarized oftentimes by the month or the week, however often they want to update the general ledger. Um, but you wouldn't see the full detail. You would just see the summary. And so that's what they're able to trace to the general ledger. This would be activity in the, in the general ledger cash account. Um, and so it's just walking through this changes in the account between the deposits and the checks and any charges that need to be accounted for. Um, and then you can note that uh, we also have, um, actually this is probably the individual that, that did um, this and this might be the reviewer up here. Uh, so this might be the, stat, the associate auditor that's actually doing the proof of cash initially and this one might be the actual senior. A lot of times you might have this all in one section. You have like a prepared by their initials and date and then prepared by their initials and date um, or even names uh, and depending on what how the electronic work papers are set up. So um, lastly this piece uh, kiting is just that that bit about the transferring uh, from one account to another that I was telling you before and so it's basically just trying to make sure um, uh, that you don't have a delay in withdrawing from one account and depositing to another um, there's some uh, advancements that make this a lot more difficult because check clearing is happening a lot faster than it used to um, but just recognize that uh, that that would have been a possibility and here's some examples of um, what kiting could look like in the sense of uh, if you compare like the dates of disbursement relative to the date of receipt. So if um, the bank says it happens on 1-3 but your client records it at 12-28 and the receipt is 12-28, right? The temptation would be um, that uh, the client might record it on 1-3 as far as the disbursement on a one count but then still keep um, the receipt uh, as of that 1228 date and then it would be basically double counting that transfer amount. And then just the last uh, topic here to kind of mention here data analytics uh, with cash and so we'll see this a little bit more when we look at the different revenue and um, purchases uh, transaction cycles. So um, if we look, for example, at uh, like large disbursements, um, you know, if we had a data table that had all of the disbursements, we could um, easily sort by size, maybe look over certain thresholds, um, and then try to evaluate whether those were improper or not. Uh, you know, expense reimbursements are another area that. Um, you can use data analytics with to look for trends or look for individuals that have lots of reimbursements um, and so there's there's definitely a host of uh, things we can do if we have the individual transaction data related to employees um, you can look for unusual sources of cash uh, in terms of like adjusting journal entries things of that nature um, and you could look for later party transactions uh, you know easily do like a um, a summary by payee you know who who the client is paying uh, and then look for related parties in that list of individuals receiving payments right so those are just a few examples of what you can do with data analytics in this area okay and so that'll wrap up uh, the topic here because because um, we're not going to cover learning objective 7 through 10 um, related to financial investments. That's something I'll leave for the graduate auditing class if you end up uh, taking that. Uh, but it's something that's beyond what we'll talk about.